Love your enemies. Love your enemies. How in the world are you supposed to love your enemies? How do you love somebody that's hurt you? How do you love somebody that loves somebody that's put you down? How do you love somebody that's talked bad about your family and told all kind of lies and tried to get you fired and run you off and hurt you physically? And how do you love that kind of person? Well, only from the Bible. If you want to turn to Luke, Luke chapter 6 and verse 35. We'll start there. Luke chapter 6 and verse 35. I have a little statement I keep on my desk. I want to read it to you. It says, The people that hurt or wrong you, he or she must face God with the wrong he or she has done to me. That is between them and God, not me. If I hold the wrong against them, I sin against God. When I forgive them, my soul is set free. You see, I'm going to show you why that is so true here in the Bible. Love your enemies. Luke chapter 6 and verse 35, the Bible says, But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be children of the Most Highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. He is kind to the unthankful and evil. So let's, let's clarify. Love your enemies. What, what kind of love are we talking about here? Love your enemies. Jesus wasn't talking about affectionate love, like I affectionately love my wife. I affectionately love my children. That's affection. But he is talking about an act of the will. I am going to tell my will that I am going to love them because God said so. You can't fall into this kind of love. It takes conscience effort to love your enemies. It means acting in their best interest, bringing them to God in prayer. And there's a great reward for loving your enemies, both on earth and in heaven. On earth, it'd be peace and joy, placed in your heart by Christ, and, and in rewards in heaven. And so loving your enemy, not, not affectionate love, like not like you love your wife or your spouse or your, your mom, or but it's an act of your will that I am going to choose to love them because it's right with God. It has nothing to do with them. It's what God said to do. And so it's between you and God. What they do and the way that they act is, is it shouldn't hinder you the, the way that you love them. And I'm going to show you how that can be done. Here's some of the rewards, crowns you can get. The incorruptible crown, the crown of life, the crown of glory, crown of righteousness, crown of rejoicing. Those are the crowns that you can earn. So tell me, what does it exactly mean to love my enemy? What do you mean, love my enemy? Well, this is exactly what it means. You have the desire that they will repent and believe the gospel. Or, if they're saved, that they'll get right with God. That's what exactly what it means to love them. That you, you want to see them get saved and, and not go to hell. Or, if they are saved, that they need to get themselves right with God before God pours His judgment out on them. And so, if that's what it means to love them, what does it mean to hate them? To hate your enemy. To hate your enemy is to want them to go to hell. Or to want to see them hurt. You know, you're going to get yours. You're, God's going to just pour His wrath out on you. And I'm not going to say I'm exempt from that because I have felt it many times. And I get back in the Word of God and I have to realize that as wretched as I was, God forgave me and I'm on my way to heaven. Thank God for that. I praise God for that. He forgave me and I didn't deserve it. I guarantee you that. But He still forgave me. You know, we're great at loving ourselves and forgiving ourselves. And this is how we, we should love and, and our neighbor and enemy, you know. Be quick to forget. Be quick to love. Um, the most Christ-like thing you could ever do is love your enemies. The most Christ-like thing you could ever do is love your enemies. Because it, they don't know what to do with that. It baffles them. It goes against everything the world says. It goes against. That's what Christ did. He loved his enemies. Right? If God did not love his enemies, there would be no Christians. There would be no Christians if God did not love his enemies. Romans 5, 8, But God commandeth, now listen to that, God commandeth his love. 
See, that's an act of his will. He's commanding his love. Romans 5.10, for when we, I'm sorry, Romans 5.8, but God commandeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it's an act of his will. He commanded his love that he's going to love us, even though we're sinners. And that's what it means to love your enemy. That I, it's an act of my will. I'm going to tell myself I'm going to love them because that's what God said to do. Not an affectionate love, but an act of the will. Now Romans 5.10 says, For if, when ye were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. By His death we are saved. Amen. Because it's death, burial, and resurrection. You know, the main reason we feel it's so hard to forgive our enemies or to love them is because we feel that we're, they're getting away with murder. They're just, they're just getting away with murder. They're just, I, I just can't let them get away with that. But the truth is, nobody gets away with anything. God keeps a record of all. And every word, deed, and action will be judged. Hebrews 9, 27 is appointed a man wants to die and then the judgment. And so that's, that's why it's so hard for us to forgive or to let go or to love because we feel like they're getting away with murder. Look what they're doing. They deserve it. But, but God says, no, I'll take care of that. Romans 12, 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. So he's talking to his dearly beloved here. He's not talking to everybody in the world. He's talking to his dearly beloved, his child. If you're a child of God, this is for you, dearly beloved. Avenge not yourself. Don't seek to re get revenge or get even. If somebody hurts you to hurt them back. He says, but rather give place unto wrath. That give place unto wrath means you're allowed to be mad. You're allowed to be upset, but give it its place. Put it in its place and say, yes, I'm mad. Yes, I hate that. I hate what they did. I hate the way they've done me. I hate the way they hurt my family. I hate that. But I'm giving it its place. And I'm giving it unto God. And I'm gonna, still going to choose to love them and pray for them. I still am mad about it. And it still has its place. But I'm not going to try to get vengeance or get even or avenge myself. I'm just going to give it to God and let God deal with it. He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. We should not interfere with what is God's right. It is God's right to seek vengeance on your behalf, to repay on your behalf. It is God's right. And if you jump in and you say, I'm going to make it happen, He'll let you make it. He'll let you do it. He'll go right ahead. But what you're really doing is you're interfering with what is God's right. And you're going to mess it up, buddy. I promise you that. Because He's already told you here. He'll give you hit. This is a command. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place in the wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Tell me, is there one thing that you really think that you can do that, that they even come close to what God can do? No, there's not. Don't think justice won't be done. How much do you trust God? You trust Him with your soul. Do you trust Him to make things right? Is somebody cut off your left arm? Do you trust Him to make that right? If somebody cut off your right arm, your right leg, do you trust him to make that right? If somebody runs your family down and tells a whole bunch of lies, do you trust him to make that right? If somebody gets you fired, do you trust him to make that right? Trust God. Is it easy? No. He does never said it. this is going to be easy. No. As a matter of fact, he said, those that live godly, yea, shall suffer persecution. If you live for God, you are going to suffer persecution. They are going to hate you, but listen, it is not you that they hate. It is God. It is what you stand for that they hate and they can't stand because they are at enmity with God. They have a problem with God. And see, there's a piece of you, there's a piece of God on the inside of you, and that's His Spirit if you're born again. And so their anger will be directed at you. And it can be demonic. It can be very demonic. You know, the, the demons know. The devil knows who's saved and who's not saved. He certainly does. And he knows who to attack. Romans 12, 20. 
Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome evil, but overcome evil with good. He says, give him food, give him hunger. For in doing so, you'll heap coals of fire upon his head. I think, yeah, that's going to make him mad and, and, and her mad. It'll just, oh, what are you doing? I, you know, they want to fight. I want to fight. And you won't fight. You'll be good to them. And they don't know how to deal with that. They don't know how to take that. And it'll make them mad. But i tell you what else it'll also do. It also, they'll be, they'll be shamed on the inside. They're never going to tell you that. They're never going to say that. They'll never probably even show it. But they'll, be, they'll have a lot of shame because they know. They know what they are. They know what they're doing. And that they know how wrong it is. And, and that, when you do something good to them, after they've treated you bad, you follow God's commands, I promise you that shame will be a light will be shining on it in their heart. Guaranteed. The Bible says it's like heaping coals of fire on their head. So we're supposed to be merciful, the Bible says in Luke chapter 6 and verse 36. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Pray for those that persecute you. Jesus and Stephen are the two best examples of that. They really are. When Jesus on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And when Stephen was being stoned, which, you know, it's one thing we can say, well, that's Jesus. That's, that's God in the flesh, you know. And I, but Stephen... Stephen wasn't even a preacher or a pastor. He was a church member that was chosen out to be a deacon, to take care of the widows, to be, you know, full of the Holy Ghost, to help run the church. But yet he, he cried out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He still loved them. He was so full of God. That's what it is. It wasn't in of himself, but he was so full of God. And so I'm, when I say love your enemy, I'm not talking about you going over beside them and and. and getting jolly with them after they beat you down. No, but I'm talking about through prayer, you can stand beside your enemy and lift them up in prayer, making pleas to God for them. Because listen, God, we, we can't even imagine how God sees sin. When God sees sin, we can't even imagine how bad it looks in His eyes. It, because there was none of us that would put somebody in hell forever. Even if they had murdered your family member, after a thousand years, or a hundred thousand years, or a million years, you would say, okay, that's, that's enough. They paid their dues. But in God's eyes, sin is so horrendous and hideous that it requires eternal damnation forever. That's how God sees sin. We can't even begin to think how God actually sees sin. But, and you know, the world would love to throw this at you. Don't, you're judging. Don't judge me. Don't, you're not supposed to judge. Not to be judging. Well, the next verse in Luke chapter 6, verse 37, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. First of all, we're not to judge their motives. They're, if I see somebody putting a $100 bill in, a, in an offering plate at church, I can't judge why they put that in there. I can't judge the intent of their heart. I can't judge the fruit. I can see what they're doing. They're putting a hundred dollar bill in there. If they put in there because they love God, or do they put in there because they want to make themselves look good, that's what God's going to judge. We cannot judge the intent. We may have what we think are some ideas and inclinations, but we can't truly judge the intent of the heart. We can't. All we can do is judge the fruit. We can't read the heart. We can't judge why a person acts the way that they do. But you can judge their fruits. The Bible says you will know them by their fruits. And you can judge, the Bible says. Don't let nobody fool you. Judge not, judge not. You can't judge. Don't judge. But you can judge, the Bible says. <laughs> That's why he says you know them by their fruits. You can judge the fruits. There you go. Oh, there's no doubt about that. 1 Corinthians 2.15 But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. If he's spiritual, he's, he's doing what's right. The intent of his heart is right. You know, the intent of his heart. And so a forgiving spirit demonstrates that a person has received God's forgiveness. A forgiving spirit demonstrates that a person has received God's forgiveness. That's right. Because if you haven't, 
it's almost impossible to forgive somebody that's really hurt you. It, it just, because your flesh will take over and you want to get even and revenge. And that's what it is with the world. You poke me in my eye and I'm going to cut your head off. That's what the world says. But that's not what Christ says. He says, I'll repay. You love them. You pray for them. You, you give them clothes. You give them food. You want the best for them. And so this last verse I want to get to is a big verse. And so many preachers quote this verse when they're talking about material things and giving and money and tithes. But that is out of context. The context here is loving and forgiving your enemy. Now I understand the implication that they're making. Give and it shall be given. Right? I understand. You can't give out God. Out give God. You give money, God's going to give you money. You, you give, God will give more. You give, God will give more. I understand that implication. But I'm talking about the context in which this verse is. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, it says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosoms. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. I say again, in the context of this verse, it is talking about loving your enemies. Give, and it shall be given. Right? You give forgiveness, and it shall be given. You give love, and it shall be given. You, you give material things, and it shall be given. Amen. Right? But, but God puts big emphasis on that. Love your enemies. Like I said, it's the most Christ-like thing that you can do. Right? And so, there's a great picture here. There's a great picture in that verse. It's the picture of a man going out and like having a, an apron folded up full of seeds. And he's just casting out seeds in a field that's been plowed everywhere he goes. And the wider he throws them, and the more that he throws them seeds, the more he's going to reap. Measure, pressed down, shaken together, and run over, he'll receive into his bosom. Spreading those seeds. You've got to put something out. You're not just going to get it by holding on to everything. No, it says give and it shall be given. Give and it shall be given. If we sow, if we sow material things, we can reap some spiritual treasures. You know that? You sow material things, you sow money, you sow offering, uh, you sow your time, you can reap some, spirit, reap some spiritual things with that, you know, of inestimable value. Of, great value in God's eyes. It is also true that we, what we keep, we lose. And what we give, we have. I forget the missionary's name, but he said, a man is not a fool that gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. What a statement. Wow. Because those treasures in heaven, you're not going to lose them. The Bible says it can't be stolen. They don't rust. They don't corrupt. You know? And so wherever you're employed, whatever community you live in, whatever neighborhood you're in, whatever church that you're at, God has put you there to be a light in this world. You alone have the answer. In a lost and dying world, you have the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, that is, if you've been born again. And you should be spreading that. Absolutely. Go forth and preach the gospel. Spread the word. Spread the word. You say, well, I'm, I'm not good at witnessing people. Well, there's great ways to witness if you can't talk to people. Buy some chick tracks and go, go down the beer aisle and the little holes in, in there where they, you, you stick up and carry them, slide them in there. Go in the elevators and they have the little emergency phone. Put them in there. Find some great places to start putting them tracks. Get the word out. You, you can do it, I promise you. God give you the grace to do it. You know, we're surrounded by people who think they're in control. We are surrounded by people who think that they are in control, and they are so far out of control, it's unbelievable. Just, just get a picture of the Earth from outer space and ask them where they're at. What speck are they on there? Uh, and get them to point that out to you. Uh, what control do you really have? Uh, none. It's an illusion, right? Most, most will die in a moment's notice. They will die in a moment's notice in a way that they would never choose. That's how they'll die. With a heart attack or a car wreck or, or a seizure or a brain aneurysm or cancer or whatever way. Shot, murdered, 
Most will die in a way that they did not choose. Things are so far out of our control, the best and wisest thing a person could ever do is trust God. Trust God to save your soul. If you've never been born again, I, I invite you today to realize that you're a sinner, that you have sinned. You've broken God's law. You and God are enemies at enmity. But Jesus Christ came to die on that cross to be the intercessor to make peace between you and God that you might realize that you're a sinner and be sorry for it, turn from it and ask for forgiveness and repent and realize that you can't save yourself that Jesus Christ is the only one and you repent of your sins and you cry out and ask Jesus save me save me I cannot save myself and that call when you call upon him it's like you were drowning in the sea and you came up for air one last time and you could say but one thing and you knew you could not save yourself and you call out to help Jesus save me that's the kind of call when you realize you're at the end of your rope that it's over the wits end I can do nothing else for myself then you cry out to Jesus and you latch a hold of that name there is power in the name of Jesus. There is but one name given among men whereby we must be saved, and that is Jesus Christ.